she uh, mentioned, uh, this is Lecture 5, a miniature colloquium series, and today we'll hear from Dr. Rick Smith. Uh, Rick recently received his PhD from the University of Texas at Austin, and is currently a Newcomb postdoctoral fellow in the anthropology department at Dartmouth. Broadly, his research merges molecular biology and social anthropology to explore the entanglements of matter and meaning the ways in which social, political, and biological forces interact to shape human bodies, past and present. He also writes about the intersections between biocolonialism, biocolonialism and genomics and the biopolitics of indigenous, queer, and white trash belonging. Rick's primary interest is in the field of paleoepigenetics, an emerging area of ancient DNA research that reconstructs chemical modifications to ancient DNA and evaluates their environmental causes. Rick conducts his paleoepigenetic work within theoretical frameworks from feminist and queer materialisms to understand the effects of class, gender, and ethnic violence in ancient civilizations of the Americas. Please join me in welcoming Rick Smith. All right, so I want to first say thanks for inviting me to talk to you all today. I'm really excited to share some research that's extremely unrelated to uh, Peru and Islands, which is a new research area that I've been uh, sort of expanding into. Um, so what I'll do is spend a couple of minutes at the beginning just sort of outlining the different areas that I work in related to previous and ongoing research. And then I'll spend about 40 minutes or so um, sort of delving into some prepared remarks that I've written on this new project about how imperial sort of sensibilities get folded into the way that paleogenomics uh, produces knowledge. So, my research broadly centers on the intersections between power and materiality. Particularly, I'm interested in the ways that human biology is co-constituted uh, at the intersection of social and material forces. So, more specifically, I've been interested in how social and political structures impact and reshape human biology over time. So currently, broadly, I'm, I'm pursuing these issues in four main areas of research. In the first one, which uh, Lizzie already mentioned her in, inter in her introduction, I'm looking at the paleoepigenetic impacts of ancient political transformation um, in central Mexico and South America. So paleoepigenetics is, if you're not familiar, is an emerging area of ancient DNA research, which goal is to reconstruct chemical modifications of the genome that occur in response to lived experiences. And because these genetic marks are shaped by lived experiences, we might be able to use them as a biomarker um, to reconstruct past life ways if we apply them to the study of ancient DNA. So I've been applying this technique or developing methods to reconstruct epigenetic marks in ancient DNA, and I've been applying them to understand social and political transformation in the Ware state of Peru. Now, the Ware are a pre this is Tatu, I'm not Ware, I don't know. <laughs> the Ware civilization. Uh, are a pre-Incan state that arose around 600 CE, but around like the first millennium or so, the state began to decline. The factors underlying this aren't fully understood yet. But bioarchaeologists have shown that there are really significant differences in lived experiences between populations who are living in Wari times versus populations who are living in post warring times. So using this technique of looking at these marks that are shaped by lived experience, my goal was to reconstruct or use that as a biomark to see if methylation actually tracks socio-political change over time. And in fact, we found that as part of my dissertation. So now I'm expanding this technique into central Mexico. Um, and mainly I'm interested in Teotihuacan. It's, it's a large urban center, um, one of the biggest to arise in, in central Mexico, not the biggest. And I'm interested here in how, again, how state development, how, how urban development shapes human biological and genetic and epigenetic variation. And because the city is divided into sort of ethnic quarters, right, there's an opportunity to understand here with this site how ethnic, gender, and class diversity may have shaped differences in lived experiences, and again, reconstruct that using DNA as a new source of information about lived experiences. So that's area number one. Area number two is looking at the genetic impacts of settler colonialism. Uh, and this is in the US and Canada among living populations, living indigenous populations. So conventionally, there's been a lot, a tremendous amount of research on the very earliest population histories in the Americas. And because of that, we have a really robust sense of very ancient histories uh, of the Americas. 
But comparatively, there's been little to no emphasis on recent population histories and how settler colonialism may have reshaped the genetic and epigenetic um, variation in the Americas. So working in collaboration with indigenous communities in the US and in Canada to try some first nations groups. Our goal here was to look at the look at and reconstruct recent population histories instead of the very ancient ones. And what we found is by looking at members who are self-identified as tribal or First Nations members, we find that there is this decline in the amount of genetic material that's being introduced into indigenous populations. From the east where you see more to the northwest where you see progressively less. So this is one of the first signals that we have to show that settler colonialism is remaking genetic diversity. Right? This is a signal of forced, forced relocation, of genocide, of disease and other factors. And then the third area is looking at similar populations, indigenous populations in the southeast. But it's, instead of looking at genetic diversity, it's looking at epigenetic diversity. And this is a project I just started at Dartmouth. Um, and the goal of this, this project is to potentially recover the effects of uh, uh, Indian relocation. In particular, we're looking at the effects of the Indian Relocation Act of 1830, better known as the Trail of Tears. So in this, we have, in this project, we're working with indigenous collaborators and we have, we're working with groups who are located east of the Mississippi, who are living on or in close proximity to ancestral land. And we're looking at populations who are west of the Mississippi who were forcibly relocated via the Trail of Tears and have ended up in Oklahoma and Texas and other places. So one of the goals, this is a very early project, but one of the goals here is to begin to, sh to trace how imperialism reshapes genetic and, and epigenetic variation. Okay, and then the last area is sort of an umbrella, sort of a theoretical area where um, a bunch of projects are coming together under the theme of queer feminist and post-colonial science and technology studies. So there's a variety of projects here that are looking at queer epistemologies of the lab, how does queer um, and class uh, situated knowledge reshape how we do the production of knowledge in the lab, and how do we remodel the lab to facilitate that work. And the second area is using material, queer and feminist materialisms, and a little bit of indigenous feminisms, to look at and reframe at the concept of epigenetic embodiment. Embodiment, if you're not familiar, is a very broad uh, term that's been used in epigenetics to sort of understand the impact that social inequalities have on um, human biology. Um, and so we're bringing, in this project, we're bringing to bear some theoretical insights into how that might be more relational and less directional. And the last one, the last area which I'm going to talk about today is a new, um, new project, an ongoing project, um, that is looking at biocolonialism and how its swift sensibilities shape how we produce knowledge uh, in ancient DNA research, uh, which is a field of theory of genomics. So this is, again, a new area of research. I'm really excited to present this to y'all and to whatever discussion and, um, we have afterwards and meeting people in discussions afterwards. I'm looking forward to being able to uh, benefit from your remarks on this project. So that's the four broad areas of my research, um, all sort of unified under the theme of power and materiality. And so I'm going to turn now to some of my written remarks on paleogenomics. And I'm going to be begin to start with a little bit of fiction, ethnogra ethnographic fiction, whatever, speculative fabulation. Um, so early explorers set foot onto a rich new continent. They encounter people who've already been living there for many thousands of years. But the people endemic to this land are different, somehow less evolved. Their culture and technology less advanced. They don't know how to use the land. They eat the bodies of their dead. But these people don't last. They succumb to diseases brought by colonizing hordes. The ones who survived the epidemics die on the weapons of conquerors. They couldn't adapt. They couldn't keep up. They vanished, went extinct. They were doomed by evolution from the start, and all that is left of them now are ruins or fragments of DNA, remnants of a time immemorial that live on only in the bodies and property of people who've taken the land as their home. So this is a story about colonization. It's also a claim about nature. And this, we're assured, is a human story, the human story. And it's a familiar one. We tell it again and again and again, but barely in any even-handed or even easily predictable way. 
It's recognizable as a kind of history that maintains and justifies a certain kind of power. But its logics have also now passed into a kind of imperial mythology, a recurrent thematic structure that threads itself through different times and places and folds them all together. On the one hand, the elements of this fiction and this history are recognizable as the story of settler colonialism in the Americas, but they're also recognizable as elements of other colonial stories that unfolded on different continents, in different centuries, and even to the present moment. But this story also turns up in even more uncanny and intractable places. We tell very similar stories about the early population encounters with Neanderthals in Europe, with Denisovans in Asia, and other peoples and states of the ancient world. But what kinds of stories could be so universal, so generative, so compelling, that they are able to explain everything from the Paleolithic to the present? What kinds of stories are so inevitable that we somehow find them unfolding again and again throughout history? What makes these stories of discovery, colonization, domination, and extinction so durable that, can be taken, that they can be taken as a given no matter where or when we tell them? In her recent book, Duress, Anne Laura Stoller grapples with what is really post about the post-colonial. Her interventions point to the recursive temporalities and strange continuities of empire, and to the many forms in which colonial histories endure in our times, and are mobilized to matter as political acts of the present. The idea that colonial structures, of course, still live on, has long been a feature of indigenous scholarship. From Vine Deloria's genealogies linking the early history of the American colonies to the politics of the Indian movement, to Patrick Wolfe's and many others ongoing interventions on settler uh, as a mode of colonialism. Of course, colonialism is never. It just goes by other names now. It takes different forms. Some of these forms are more perceptible to us, lodged in the structures of oppression and displacement with which colonial, post-colonial, and indigenous scholars and activists have long grappled. Others are less perceptible, less questioned, and in order to bring them to the surface, we need a different kind of attunement to the imperial sensibilities in which our regimes of knowledge get lodged. Following Stoller, how might we train our sensibilities beyond the more easily identifiable forms that some colonial scholarship schools us to recognize and see? While Stoller, Wolfs, and others post-colonial and indigenous interventions have done much to link the colonial past with our present moments and possible futures, my goal is to evaluate how times, how other times, places, and bodies are brought within the realm of imperial power, and how the more distant past become sites of contestation to maintain contemporary social conditions. My goal in this paper is to begin to chart what I refer to as the gravitational field of imperial power, a force that it somehow enables it to pull objects and relations from other times and places, compress them all together, and ground them within a single conceptual terrain. To do this, I will draw on recent post-colonial and decolonial scholarship into conversation with emerging knowledges from the fields of ancient DNA, archaeology, and paleoanthropology. I want to consider in this paper the conceptual repertoires and the techno-scientific means through which settler colonial stories get reactivated in ancient landscapes where all too familiar characters go by other names. Drawing on Stoller, I will trace the storied afterlives of ancient bodies, the politics that are exhumed alongside them, and the enduring qualities of empire that exert their forces on rubble and bone far older than any empire. In doing so, I hope to begin to map some of the reciprocities between paleogenomics, archaeology, and paleoanthropology and imperial systems of power, through which the past and present are folded together, and certain biocolonial natures are made real. So I want to look to do this, I want to look at two related areas where I see biocolonial uh, stories getting reanimated on ancient landscapes. First, I want to look at discourses around Neanderthals and ancient humans that are emerging in contemporary popular culture. And here I'm going to focus on the PBS docu-series called First Peoples, as well as other popular media stories disseminated through sites like Vox and the Atlantic. Um, and next, I'll revisit scientific evidence from the fields, primary scientific evidence from the fields of ancient DNA, archaeology, and paleoanthropology, and how viewing the interactions between Neanderthals and early humans 
through imperial lenses has helped to characterize biocolonialism as a defining feature of European people throughout time. My goals here are not necessarily critique, but instead I want to surface certain imperial subjectivities that define what counts as history and how history is conscribed to maintain settler conditions of imperialism today. So in the summer of 2015, the Public Broadcasting Service premiered a five-part television series, documentary series called First Peoples, which examined the recent advances in archaeology and paleogenomics to show how, quote, historians and scientists are together rewriting the family tree, rewriting the family tree of the whole human race. Each episode of the series traced the origins of people living on different continents, the Americas, Africa, Australia, Asia, and Europe. The series provided a, <laughs> provides, I think, a good illustration of how the past is a site of active contestation in science and in popular media, and how understandings of human history become reworked through imperial sensibility. The, com the concluding episode of Europe, which will be the focus of some of my work today, serves as a case in point. It illustrates how colonial ideas shape paleogenomics and perpetuate the social conditions of the settler state in the broader public. There are many aspects of this miniseries that I'm currently working through as part of this project, but for today I want to focus on just one vignette, um, one or two vignettes rather, from the series that deal with the interactions between so-called modern humans and Neanderthals that unfolded in Paleolithic Europe. I hope these examples will help to chart the gravitational influence of imperialist thinking on the objects, bodies, and spaces of a distant past and how bringing all of these within the realm of imperial power helped sustain both material and symbolic violence in the present. So in the documentary First Peoples, as anatomically modern humans are shown pushing out of Africa towards Neanderthal land, the narrator tells us that they were there were initially cultural and technological distinctions between humans and Neanderthals at that time. For example, the Shadoperonian, I hope I'm saying that right, Shadoperonian tool tradition the oldest technological industry of the Upper Paleolithic era in southwestern Europe is noted as one such a technological similarity between Neanderthals and humans when they first met. So both humans and Neanderthals are using similar tools. This technological tr tr tradition included spear points shown here, made by Neanderthals, which are oddly similar to those made by modern humans, though they appear to have maybe been produced using a different production technique. While there are several theories concerning the emergence and the use of these tools among Neanderthals, one leading inter interpretation that was offered to us by Dr. Jean-Jacques Blanc in First Peoples is that the spear point technology shown here originated with anatomically modern humans, but was later adopted by Neanderthals who copied the design using a different technique. In First Peoples, the adoption and modification of human technologies by Neanderthals is, in term, is interpreted as a form of culture, cultural uh, appropriation, or rather acculturation, that they are taking up the technology and culture of their colonizers. This so-called acculturation is said to signify, quote, the beginning of the end for Neanderthals. According to the narration, when Neanderthals and humans were, in, while humans and Neanderthals were initially on this level playing field, they were now suddenly playing catch up, adopting other people's technology, learning from them, not innovating on their own. In an attempt to convey both the processes of colonization and the technological distinctions between Neanderthals and humans observed in these tool industries, First Peoples makes the following comparison, which is gonna be the center of the rest of this collaboration, with more recent colonial encounters between Europeans and Native Americans in North America. And it's this comparison that I want to give careful attention in this section. Quote, something similar happened 400 years ago when Europeans brought horses to North America. The native people realized without ever being taught, realized how useful these animals were and learned to ride them without ever being taught by Europeans. The idea spread so quickly and so effectively that horses became central to the culture of Plains Indians. But no matter how good they were at adapting to the new culture, they couldn't keep up, overwhelmed by the sheer number of Europeans moving onto their land. With the Shadoperonian technology, we see that Neanderthals faced the same fate, overwhelmed by the spread of modern humans.
So the comparison of Neanderthal extinction with the genocide of Native Americans and other indigenous groups is not necessarily new. This comparison is long figured into discussions of European colonization. Rather, what I want to point to that is new here is the particular sets of evidence that are being marshaled in favor of this explanation. And in, in support, the narratives that are being marshaled in support of established narratives that shape how we think about Neanderthal and human relations. Here, paleogenomics and paleolithic archaeology have been used in the retelling of an all too familiar and decisively biocolonial story, one in which biology, behavior, and evolution have been drawn together in ways that are supposed to have predictable outcomes for the colonizers. In First Peoples, Dr. John Hawkes elaborates on the scenario, presenting his view that Neanderthals were swamped by successive waves of migration and that humans today inherit very little of their DNA from Neanderthals because of biological dilution. A process in which Neanderthal genes are gradually reduced relative to those of contemporary humans through many generations of intermating with other humans. So while this is certainly one possible explanation that sort of surfaced in paleogenomic literature, other scenarios such as low levels of intermating between Neanderthals and humans or natural selection against harmful alleles could also explain this pattern. And these explanations aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Many forces may have been acting in concert to shape the patterns of genetic variation we see in populations today. But the use of the term swamped suggests a magnitude and speed of colonization that aligns events with Paleolithic Europe with what happened during European um, colonization over the last several centuries. But these events worked over entirely different orders of magnitude, both in terms of the scale and timing of demographic change. In First People, however, the genetic evidence is taken to indicate that Neanderthals, like indigenous people, were observed into the modern human population genetically, physiologically, and culturally. Such comparisons are not limited to speaking of recent colonization in the United States, but are also used to characterize indigenous peoples in other settler colonial settings. In a subsequent interview for Vox magazine, Hawks notes, quote, when we look at history and we see what Australian Aboriginals went through, what Native American people went through, what Easter Islanders went through, it's hard to say that the Neanderthals would have been better off than those historical cases. In fact, it's probably the case that Neanderthals went through the Paleolithic version of the contacts we know about through history. Now, historical colonization has little in common with the events of Paleolithic Europe, and yet Western ideas about settler colonialism and its relationship with indigenous bodies have greatly shaped how we interpret Neanderthal archaeology and paleogenomics. This vignette, I think, is one example of how the material remnants of the past get pulled onto imperialism's theoretical terrain. In this example, emerging evidence from paleogenomics is being interpreted as is not being interpreted in an unbiased fashion. Not that it ever is, of course. But rather, interpretations of evidence are being profoundly shaped by the conceptual repertoires of European settler history. Imperialism trains us to look for certain kinds of lessons and not others. It trains us to look for history's proper form. Rather than understanding the history of interactions between early humans and Neanderthals in Europe on their own terms, American colonial history and completely and colonial history in other contexts is being used to shape understandings of unrelated Paleolithic events as if they operated as a single biocolonial process. This creates problems for how we understand both contemporary colonial relations as well as the Paleolithic demographic history. These comparisons, of course, dehumanize indigenous peoples and draw upon old conventions in the colonial race science that have long depicted the colonized as primitive and out of time, in contrast to the presumed biological and technological modernity of Europeans uh, and colonizers more generally through history. In addition, I think that likening the extinction of Neanderthals to genocide of the Native Americans in the US results in a number of material and symbolic violences. First, this comparison draws together entirely di distinct episodes from the past, separated by thousands of millennia, as I said, as a single universal process, as if distinct events may be equally understood in terms of colonization driven by the same sets of biological, technological, and social relations between European col colonizers and various endemic populations of the world and across time. 
However, these events not only took place at distinct periods of time, but at entirely different rates that vary by orders of magnitude. While ongoing processes of recent settler colonialism, thus in the comparison offered by First Peoples, space and time are distorted. They're compressed together through the lens of more recent population history, warping our understanding of the past and present. Second, I think this comparison conflates extinction, and this is a tricky distinction, conflates extinction with genocide and consistently equivocates about the taxonomic place of Neanderthals and, in fact, other humans. This collapses notions of race and species together in ways that inherit the thinking of 20th century eugenicists and their intellectual progenitors in the Victorian era race, uh, Victorian era race science. In First Peoples, and indeed much of the paleogenomic literature, the legacies of this kind of thinking are reproduced as intellectual slippages between the concepts of extinction describing natural history of species with that of acculturation, hybridization, and assimilation describing social and biological histories of race. This slippage conflates various processes as distinct, indistinct processes of biocolonialism, and because of this, the usage and meaning of extinction is deeply problematic. In First Peoples, and indeed much of its colloquial usage, the term extinction is not strictly limited to describing the disappearance of a species, but it's also used to talk about biosocial quelling and absorption of colonized people into the white body. As in Svante Pablo's, Svante Pablo's famous quote, Neanderthals aren't gone, they live on in us. In this sense, paleogenomics is being used to make core claims about existence, the parameters of extinction and survival that operates in settler states, and who ultimately inherits the power. In effect, if indigenous people are gone and live only on live on only in the DNA of their colonizers, then the colonizers themselves become the rightful heirs of vanquished people and the only ones who are left to speak on their behalf. It has been argued by Kim Tallbear and Scott Morganson and others that such thinking helps to legitimize settlers' moral and biological claims to power over colonized land and people, justifying both the emergence of ongoing existence. This justifies the emergence and ongoing existence and possible futures of the settler state. Now, this kind of logic normalizes the conditions through which various claims are made in First Peoples, where we get told that, quote, Neanderthals didn't have a chance in the end, but there was no great moment of extinction. Instead, they were gradually assimilated by modern humans, unquote. Rather than a, bio, rather than a colonial biopolitics centered on the historical trope of eradication, Ancient DNA is being used to bring Neanderthal death and extinction within the realm of biocolonial power and subjugation, perpetuating the social conditions of the modern settler state. The use of paleogenomics and paleolithic archaeology to simultaneously explain the success of European colonizers, the extinction of Neanderthals, and the genocide of indigenous peoples is deeply connected to historical narratives that manifest destiny that justify European expansion through the American West. Here, possession and power over colonized territories are viewed as the inevitable outcomes of European exceptionalism and biological and technological superiority. In First Peoples, paleogenomic narratives of ancient Europe and their confluence with American colonization helps to convey European domination, and this is the take home. European domination becomes not only inevitable, but timeless and natural. Neanderthals and by association, Native Americans are racialized as subhuman, biologically inferior populations who succumb to the superior techniculture of their colonizers. And the violence that these logics have animated isn't confined to the cultural and biological genocides of the 19th century. These logics also underlie ongoing violences in the present. During the recent protests at Standing Rock, South Dakota, we were once again witness to narratives about primeval plains Indians standing in the, in the path of technological and economic progress, the technological and economic progress of settlers. We were witness again to violent contestations over lands and resources that depend on the extinction and subjugation of indigenous life that insist that indigenous people are always and forever vanishing, crushed in the march of imperial modernity. We cannot compare Plains Indians to Neanderthals and act like those comparisons have not always activated imperial violence from the first moment that Europeans set foot in the Americas. According to Ann Laura Stoller, 
To compare is a situated and political act of discernment, a virtual performative that can implicitly confirm the rationale for future violence and create the fears that strategic com comparisons only profess to name. The paradox of comparison is that the judgment of pertinent, pertinence rests on the equation of unequal things. And it is precisely around these equivocations that the adequacy of those equivalences, that the political weight of comparison depends. Finally, I want to emphasize that the conflation of recent colon colonial histories with far more ancient events help to create a historical narrative in which domination has become reimagined, not just a feature of recent settlers that are used to justify contemporary structures of power, but as the foundational features of European uh, biological and cultural origins. The combination of Paleolithic material records with ancient DNA is being used to transpose the realities of the present political moment to make sense of the past. In this imagined history, Neanderthals become transformed into an archetypal indigenous people through which Europeans can naturalize their own biosocial supremacy through their entire existence as a people. This is not to say that scientific data itself is inherently biocolonial, but rather to draw attention to the imperial subjectivities and sensibilities that reproduce its own stories and include other possibilities. During the closing minutes of the episode, riding in a cable car over the skyline of London's Canary Wharf, John Hawkes offers the following epilogue, quote, once we lived in a world inhabited by all kinds of humans, Neanderthals, Denisovans, probably several different kinds in Africa, and now they're all gone, and we're the only ones that are left. <clears throat> we won the game. We were better at connecting, better at creating networks, better at living in larger groups, and those things all feed on each other. Once you're living in larger groups, you're making more connections, you become more creative, it's an exponential process. Where we end up is here, gesturing to the skyline of the Canary War. In our modern complex world, this is the end result of those seeds sown by the first peoples as they left Africa and colonized every continent of the world." Unquote. The final remarks of this series present us with a teleological narrative of culture evolution, one that casts Western Europe and European imperialism as the apex and inevitable outcome of human biological and evolution, I'm sorry, of human biology and the evolutionary forces that have shaped it. Of the five episode arc of First Peoples, the episode on, on Europe is the last one. And the ordering of the episodes plays an important role in how we're supposed to interpret these comments. Had the series been arranged chronologically, as events actually happened, we might have ended up in the Americas, the last major continent at least, to be inhabited by humans. And instead, the series ends here in Europe, concluding in a decidedly non-chronological manner that instead favors an ethnocentric emphasis on culture hierarchies and European exceptionalism on which imperial logics depend. The past and the present are thus linked by a common thread of biocolonialism, one that now takes its roots in the very foundation of Europe and the origin of Europeans as a people. Okay, so I want to now turn to uh, Neanderthals as they're portrayed in archaeogenomics. One of the critiques is like, well, Rick, this is pop culture. Things have to be disseminated in a way more accessible, yada, yada, and I'm going, no. <laughs> no. Um, so now I'm going to go to Neanderthals and archaeogenomics itself, which is an ancient DNA is an area that I work in. Um, so enduring forms of biocolonialism that shape what we can know about the past are not limited to popular science, but they're also embedded within primio, primary paleogenomic research itself. Genetic studies of humans and non-humans are often taken as the highly, if not the most informative and authoritative account of history. But they're, of course, often far from politically neutral, and their claims about the past are not free from imperial subjectivities that I've been attempting to chart in this talk. These days, ancient DNA research has become central to how we are supposed to understand the interactions between our other than human relations, the Neanderthals. In one sense, Paleogenomic research into these interactions is challenging certain historical distinctions that have been made between us and our so-called less evolved Neanderthal kin. 
And these developments have shifted what counts as human and even destabilized the validity of homo sapiens as a valid category of analysis. In another sense, paleogenomic research on Neanderthals has inherited the tradition of biocolonial thinking in archaeology and paleoanthropology that has long characterized Neanderthals as an archetypal brute against which Europeans imagine their own conquest. So paleogenomics is often paradoxical and has been summoned as evidence in support of very different and even contradictory ends. So to bring some of these issues into focus, I want to consider evidence from a number of paleogenomic, primary paleogenomic studies that have been published in recent years. So in, in 2010, <clears throat> the first complete genome of a Neanderthal uh, was published in the journal Science. This study was of great interest because, of course, Neanderthals are our closest hominin relatives, having diverged from a common ancestor some eight, nine hundred thousand years ago to give rise to a morphologically distinct population that was isolated to Eurasia. Archaeological and paleogenomic evidence suggests that modern humans first came into contact with Neanderthals between 60 to 100,000 years ago, but this is getting pushed back even further, 130, 150,000 years ago, shortly after the migrating out of Africa, where our species first evolved. Previously, there had been some debate among paleoanthropologists around whether humans and Neanderthals might have been mated. This wasn't a possibility that just arose out of genomics, but had been suggested before. But a prevailing theory was that Neanderthals were a separate, distinct, and decidedly primitive species that had been driven to extinction by human expansion through Eurasia with their superior culture and advanced technology. Sounds familiar, right? <laughs> this idea of reproductive and behavioral isolation of Neanderthals was initially supported by ancient mitochondrial genomes. So this is a separate part of the genome that was studied back in the early 2000s that showed um, mitochondrial sequences between humans and Neanderthals were distinct and showed no evidence that we had ever intermated. So in the early 2000s, we were still under this assumption that they had been driven to extinction by Europeans. Um, so, but then in 2010, by comparing the full genome sequence of Neanderthals with those of five living human populations from around the world, geneticists subsequently found that populations living outside of sub-Saharan Africa, and now we know it's in Africa as well, um, derive as much as 4% of their genome from the so-called archaic hominins of Europe, providing the first definitive evidence that humans and Neanderthals intermated with one another some point after humans left Africa. So this evidence from ancient DNA, I think, has shattered any illusions, and this is an ongoing matter of debate, but I think it's shattered any illusions that Neanderthals could reasonably be considered a separate species, at least as the category of species has been defined in biology as a groups, quote, groups of actually and potentially interbreeding natural populations which are reproductively isolated from other groups. That's Ernst Mayer's definition of species from the 40s. Since we now know that genetic evidence we now know from genetic evidence that humans and Neanderthals intermated in Eurasia and elsewhere, as we're learning. Not only can humans no longer be considered a separate biological species, at least under the strictest definition, but the prevailing theories of Neanderthal extinction also must come under scrutiny. If extinction means the end of a biological species, if it means that the species does not leave direct descendants, then Neanderthals are in fact not extinct because they have left biological descendants among nearly every population in the world and nearly every Therefore, to continue to invoke concepts of extinction with regard to Neanderthals requires the application of a different kind of definition, a different kind of, either a different kind of species concept, such as the ecological species concept, or the conflation of biological extinctions, as we outlined earlier, the conflation of extinction processes with those of assimilation. They can be extinct if they've been assimilated under imperial logic in which populations disappear by being absorbed into other groups. So the long-standing separation of humans from other than humans via the concept of species has been significantly challenged by emerging paleogenomic uh, evidence. Narratives ex of extinction, however, have persisted in discourses of Neanderthals, perhaps driven by contemporary imperial ideas about acculturation and absorption that I've outlined among contemporary settler states. So in addition to the destabilization of humans as a distinct and separate species, ancient DNA evidence has also helped to remake the image of Neanderthals. <laughs> so early descriptions of a Neanderthal from La Chapelle Assam by uh, paleontologist Marcel Wu 
uh, envisioned them as these hunched, hairy, savage cave dwellers, much more reminiscent of our very ancient ancestors than of contemporary humans. But this reconstruction had profound effects on popular and scientific concepts of Neanderthals for the rest of the 20th century. However, these reconstructions were made based on isolated fossil material. Subsequent fossil and genetic findings have substantially changed this picture, such that Neanderthals are now made in a more human, or fully human, likeness. Nonetheless, the question of whether Neanderthals were fully human remains a matter of debate in paleoanthropology. Archaeological and paleogenomic evidence have made the line between human and other than human, modern and archaic, less and less distinct. And at the same time, a shift has occurred from speaking of Neanderthals in terms of their eradication to speaking of them as being acculturated and absorbed through DNA. A shift that I argued earlier helps to sustain biopower narratives of European imperialism through time. Prior to the recovery of the full Neanderthal genome, analysis of short fragments of nuclear DNA had already demonstrated that there was phenotypic variation among Neanderthals. So this happened years before this, this uh, version of Neanderthal's countenance came out. This research showed that uh, at least some Neanderthals had genes associated with light skin, pale eyes, and red hair, not unlike many humans today. Other research showed that Neanderthals shared a version of the FOXP2 gene with humans, which has been implicated in the development of vocalization and language. There's this potential that humans were um, communicating with Neanderthals. Um, so based on this evidence, scientists have suggested that Neanderthals may have shared a capacity for speech. So in addition, recent archaeological findings or re-evaluations of archaeological evidence are presenting new challenges to the ideas that Neanderthals were behaviorally primitive compared to modern humans. Based on a re-evaluation of excavations at La Chapelle Sainte, there's some evidence that Neanderthals bury their dead, though this inter interpretation remains really controversial in paleoanthropology. Excavations at Cueva de los Aviones in south, uh, southeast Spain have shown that Neanderthals manufactured pigment for, pigment for body ornamentation many thousands of years prior to the arrival of humans, suggesting that they were no less behaviorally modern than contemporaneous human populations elsewhere. They also may have created some of the oldest symbolic cave engravings and aesthetic ornamentation found in Europe. These behaviors were once part of the suite of characteristics that were thought to distinguish behaviorally modern humans from their Neanderthal counterparts or their archaic counterparts. And while these findings are still generating heat, heated debate, the idea that Neanderthals were in fact behaviorally uh, uh, inferior, technologically inferior to modern humans is far from certain. Rather, it's becoming more and more clear that Neanderthals lived and behaved in similar ways as humans. Okay. So given this evidence from archaeology and paleogenomics, the biological, behavioral, social, and cultural distinctions between humans and Neanderthals are being eroded. It is perhaps no coincidence then, because these boundaries are being eroded, it's no coincidence then that since evidence of our genetic similarity and intermating has come to light, Neanderthals have been substantially transfigured from something other than human into the image of living humans from something that must have been eradicated to something that must have been absorbed. The narrative that European colonizers were culturally and technologically superior is no longer a foregone conclusion, but this primitive modern divide so reminiscent of imperial histories often continues to characterize popular and scientific discussions of Neanderthals in Europe. For example, and this is a really telling one, there are ongoing studies that suggest that Neanderthals practiced cannibalism. These claims have been controversial because, of course, evidence for cannibalism is hard to support. It can be difficult to distinguish from other kinds of damage or post-mortem modification to remains, such as marks on bones that get caused by carnivores, eating them, scavengers, or other post-mortem processes that can resemble butchery. So the possibility of cannibalism among Neanderthals was suggested as early as 1901, based on remains from excavated from the site of Krapina in Croatia. But this interpretation has been disputed as a result of, and has been suggested that it might actually be due to processes of ex exhuming and then reburial that's leaving these marks. 
Nonetheless, a number of studies now claim to have identified evidence for cannibalism in Neanderthals, and this is ongoing, these studies are in the last few years, including bones excavated at the sites of, I'm just going to say the locations, southern France, Iran, and Belgium. So this is within the last two to three years. Now, aside from the scientific, and I'm not an archaeologist, so I'm going to put aside the controversy of whether this is compelling evidence or not, because that's not what's important to me. So aside from the scientific controversies over whether this evidence for Neanderthal can cannibalism is compelling or not, the evidence for it is still somewhat sparse, and the meaning and social context of cannibalism is not well understood. Given the role that notions of cannibalism have played in the colonial era, I think it's worth considering, rather than whether these claims are legitimate or not, the role that they play um, in characterizing relations between European imperial modernity and its other subjects. And why Westerners hold exotic desires for stories of cannibalism in the first place. Claims of cannibalism have long been used to mark a world outside of European modernity and outside of enlightenment, marking the profane and the primitive, and justifying the need for biocolonization and social progress for collective good. Cannibalism is rare. Evidence for it is often controversial, but the idea of cannibalism as a tool for imperial imagination funks as, functions as a mechanism of power to justify imperial subjugation and dispossession of indigenous peoples. And this is ongoing, right? Claims of cannibalism underlie much of the claiming of the West and South, among Southwestern tribes, and it's like this recurring narrative of like these primitive cannibalistic people which we must convert and save, right? And absorb. <clears throat> So thus, recent archaeological and paleogenomic evidence has helped to upend historical assumptions about the rigid biological and cultural distinctions between humans and Neanderthals, leading to more permeable understandings of what constitutes human beings. But at the same time, these findings have been incorporated into other contemporary debates about biocultural differences among living humans. So this is this getting into the idea that Neanderthals are, that Neanderthal's racialization has been shifting as a result of these paleogenomic um, uh, findings. So the idea that we intermated with Neanderthals, given the old model that they were this other species, right? The idea that we intermated with Neanderthals might have represented, in fact, did represent in racial science literature at the time, contamination of advanced humans, advanced Europeans, by their inferior archaic relatives. But instead, genetic and evidence of our interbreeding that's coming out of paleogenomics has sometimes been used to support the claim that instead, of course, Europeans are more highly adapted, not more contaminated, uh, than sub-Saharan Africans. This argument has been similarly asserted by white supremacist groups. They've latched on to this idea that Neanderthals and humans in Europe intermated. White supremacist groups have latched on to this to claim that Neanderthal intermating drove the biological distinctiveness of Europeans. This is work by Terence Keel, uh, who's, who's done some of this. So while ancient DNA has helped to dissolve some of the distinctions between humans in the past, it's also being used to intensify contemporary biocolonial boundaries of race. Such claims are in some way tied to shifting racializations uh, of Neanderthals that has occurred alongside paleogenomic research, from early representations and shifting representations in terms of their blackness to those that are increasingly adjacent to indigeneity and whiteness. The colonial logics of hypodescent ensure that blackness can never be absorbed into whiteness. And that blackness, because of this, blackness is therefore always maintained as a kind of existential threat to whiteness. We see these themes emerging through the 20th century and how we think about Neanderthals. Emerging racializations of Neanderthals instead lead us to other imperialisms. By mirroring forms of indigeneity in the Americas, their remodeled bodies are ones that can now become absorbable and even must be absorbed to support these long-term imperial stories that I've been outlining. Now, Neanderthals have, now that Neanderthals have been made absorbable, geneticists and others have begun to consider what traits their genomes might be contributing to living populations today. For example, the genomes obtained from Neanderthals and Denisovans have made it possible to investigate how our, how our intermating shared genes that may have made us more adapted to some environments or less adapted to others in various human populations. <clears throat> For example, and of course this follows very predictable 
very predictable arc, right? Europeans are going to have the alleles that are adaptive and supportive, and then the global south are going to inherit the alleles that lead to disease and difference, right? Um, so for example, Europeans and East Asians show frequencies of Denisovan derives gene for keratin protein found in skin, hair, nail structure, skin in particular, that has been argued to have adaptive, adaptive importance, although the biological reason for that is, I don't, I don't understand that argument. Um, so in addition, Tibetans living at high altitude in the Himalayas appear to have received a gene from Denisovans that is very useful for breathing at high altitudes where atmospheric oxygen levels are low. So on the other hand, moving to the global south, it's been argued that Neanderthal genes may have had negative consequences for other populations. Researchers have suggested, for example, that Native Americans have higher proportions of Neanderthal and Denisovan derived alleles than other global populations. This is without any actual science looking at the same variant in other populations. <clears throat> so one recent study indicates that a variant, I'm going to skip it, it's a very long series of letters because geneticists, um, it's a genetic risk factor for type 2 diabetes. Scientists have found this in Mexican populations and have argued that it was introduced into these populations through intermating with Neanderthals. This is without looking at any other population for this gene. They're just looking at Mexicans and saying these this gene came from Neanderthals and only Mexicans have it and it makes them diabetic. However, the extent to which similar genes are found in other populations has been understudied. So this study also fail, or falls in line with decades of research, like this is ongoing, this isn't new, decades of research about the biological basis of diabetes in minority populations that seeks and needs a genetic ancestor, a genetic answer for the basis of disease without attending to the effects of social inequalities, which are known to have large, and in fact larger effects, right, on the development of disease. Um, so these results may have less to do with any real differences between human genetic variation and much more to do with what we expect about the geopolitics of disease and how uneven those expe expectations are. So I suggest that if we really want to understand what's causing diabetes, we better get real ready to understand colonialism. Without that, I'm honestly sure not, I'm not sure what geneticists are doing. And I'm one of them. So taken together, the story emerging out of Neanderthal archaeogenomics is one where human explorers enter a new land, inhabit it, and this is all supported by paleogenomic evidence, explorers inhabit a new land where they find primitive, cannibalistic, culturally and technologically inferior people who have vanished in the face of conquest, succumb to disease absorbed by the colonizers. And while these are certainly one set of possible histories that might have some evidence for them, my goal in pursuing this work has begun to question the imperial sensibilities through which paleogenomics reproduces certain oddly familiar narratives, and to ask how these stories might be used to imagine and reproduce imperial natures, and to trace other and to trace how other times and places are brought within the realm of imperial power. Thanks. see mitochondrial DNA because it's maternally inherited. So that initial study showed in 2010 that it was from Neanderthals to humans, but subsequent subsequent analysis, and there's one paper that happened came out a year ago, that showed that humans were in fact elsewhere in the old world. We just don't have fossil evidence of them or evidence that they were there, but we see evidence of introgression from African populations into Denisovans 130,000 years ago. So it depends on where you are in space and what's going on. It's complicated, right? This is like this out of Africa hypothesis, right? It's been completely obliterated. Like it's all people are moving all over the place and doing things in all different ways. You're making me regret all the teaching I did last week. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I had a question about teaching, actually. Yep. Um, I 
really like the talk, and I really like the sort of how you point out kind of the sloppiness and poor analogy of using European imperialism pluralism for this topic, right? But for an introductory class, for an Anth 101 class, yeah. you've got 45 minutes, it's Thursday morning, uh -huh. it's 9 a.m., <laughs> you've got to yeah. review grants, you've got to do all this other stuff, right? Uh -huh. What sort of analogies, if you could speculate, or what sort of educational analogies would you Migration is that, a, is that? I mean, so I'm not sure if you can because of how complex the topic it is. Yeah, I'm not sure if you can. You have to resort to some analogy or some sort of um, yeah. using the familiar to teach them. Yeah, you know, right. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I have curricular suggestions other than to say like, it. Yes, it's it's complicated, and I think. So I mean, the way that I tend to teach this is not to te teach them teleologically, right? It's to say that like. There's no way these people aren't human, right? Biological evidence does that. So my I give them exercises sometimes which say, why, right? Why are these the narratives that we and have them think through and work through why it is that we're telling certain kind of stories of people. And like this picture is now just a mess. Like this is one from two years ago. It's now just like a it's not even a tree, it's like a bush or I don't even know. It's some other thing where there's all of these connections, right? And it's just impossible, right? You can't tease it apart. So like why, and to have them think specifically about, I think, maybe this will help, I don't know. Why do we think about the agencies of colonization the way that we do? And what are the other ways we might think about the agencies of people interacting with each other? I don't know if that helps. Well, if you figure it out, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> yes? So, so you find that the, Sorry. You're finding that after the 2010 moment that the humanizing of Given the fact that in the past, the recent sort of post Armenian period, we've seen as apes, very close to apes, and yet after 2010, it's discovered that they're, they're, you know, that they're contributing to their genome. Yeah. They all the magic start to become humanized. But are you saying that, that humanization of them is disingenuous in some way? I'm not saying it's disingenuous, I'm saying it's politically important. So I wouldn't say that it's disingenuous to say that they are in fact more like us. We should have known that from the start. It's another kind of imperial narrative to say that these are <coughs> populations that were eradicated, right? That's a different kind of colonial manifest destiny narrative. This is all imperialism, no matter what story we tell. So I guess my point is to not say that their humanization is problematic, because I don't think it is. I think the ways that we represent their humanization through their indigenous whiteness are problematic. But I think scientists mean it. <laughs> yeah, so I think that they're politically expedient is what I would point to. On another note, Terence Keel, you're saying that white supremacists have begun to use the fact that there is uh, yeah. the Angelo genome uh, presence, a large, a large presence of the Angelo genome in European populations as a, a move towards supremacy. Whereas I'm thinking that in the past, because of the long 20th century representation of the Angelos as vastly inferior, what, what would make the white supremacists draw that in as something that would separate them in some sort of Way. Yeah, I mean, the curious thing about white biopolitics is that we're always going to come up with an explanation for why we're on top. This happens, you know, like, it, 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 anywhere you look, that's the case, right? You look at athleticism in the 20th century prior to the World War II, you have African athletes could never possibly beat white Olympian German athletes, right? And then suddenly an a athlete beats them and the narrative immediately changed, like, of course they did, they're an animal, right? There's this entire different racialization, it, it will take whatever elements that are sort of expedient to the political moment and remake them for an imperial movement, right? Imperial thing is the threat, not, and the evidence that, that we marshal in favor of that shift, <clears throat> I think. As first peoples, uh, should it be considered, I don't want to say the most standard, but the most contemporary standard, or what's going on in the populist sphere with regard to representation of the religionomics for the broad population, or is it I think, I mean, so First Peoples was made in 2015. So it's recent. There's been, of course, findings since now because paleogenomics is just exploding. So every few months there's a new paper. But I think it's in terms of how that information is disseminated to the public, that's a very consistent narrative. And I think one that's even here at scientific conferences, which people discuss um, Neanderthals and try to communicate that to the public. Um,
So your question is about like how do how do students make their age within Africa? How do we how do we deal with that to maintain? You no, know, I mean like in the United States when when uh, when they are doing their research and putting out there is how do they how do they see its impact in present politics? I think John Hawkes is a very compelling example of someone who's been very formative in the field of paleogenomics, who is directly communicating, like I quoted him multiple times, right, in this talk, directly communicating the exact things I'm trying to outline. So I think there is this slippage, right? I mean, that's not to say that, I say it's not disingenuous because they do mean it, right? There is, there's this um, sense in which the evidence is true, it's just the interpretation, right? I mean, so what I'm trying to point to is like, why is there this common sense, right, that like, is never questioned about how we should be interpreting these results, right? It's not that it's malicious, it's that it's common imperial sense, right, that has malicious and political violent outcomes. Right? I don't know if that helps. How many people do you think, I mean, I think to this question, like, how common is it for people doing this work to be reflexive and think about the political implications of the work, to think about the narratives that they're using and or how their data can be used to inform or reinforce these narratives. Like how common is it for people to sort of think about that at, you know, in terms of the people who are doing the work? Not very. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not very. There's a really I mean the major labs that are doing this work, right, are Esky Miller's Lab, Santi Pablo's lab. Um, uh, and there's not, I mean, they're pumping, so one of the issues I think is that you have biologists who are finding this, what I think is really amazing and interesting results, right? But then they only have a certain repertoire with which they're able to tell that story, right? So I don't think they're, I mean, the reason I wrote this paper is because, precisely because there has been so little problematization of this. And Terrence Keel has a paper, and my advisor, Deborah Bullman, who presented one of these at the a triple A's, and I didn't present this here because there's just so much, right, about Neanderthal paleogenomics that one can bring into this group. Um, but Terence Keel's worked on like how white supremacists are using this group and how the shifting narratives of admixture are being deployed there. Um, and then, I mean, it's not uncommon, right? White supremacists also are taking 23 of me and saying I'm Cherokee, and therefore this land is mine, right? It's the same shit, right, over and over and over. Um, so I, the reason I wrote this paper is because there has been precisely so little attunement. But Terence Peel's writing on white supremacy, he's also writing on this SLC 6A11 gene, this diabetes gene that people say is giving Mexican Americans and Mexicans diabetes. That'll be a paper that they present with AAA, so I didn't elaborate that too much, but there are a couple of other threads that people are starting to work on. Yeah. Following up on that, I'm curious to hear you talk a little bit about the difference between when data is getting picked up and interpreted versus when the data is being produced. Um, and to talk a little bit, I mean, the, it sounds like the study that you were talking about with this, this diabetes gene is one where there are some fundamental data collection issues in addition to data interpretation issues. But can you like unpack those two yeah. distinctions a little so bit? So I'll say first of all, I'll say first of all that there's always a fundamental data collection with ancient DNA because bones, not every bone that we wish we had, we have. So there's always a fundamental data collection issue, right, and what we can compare to. This isn't just in pop culture. Like, I want to be very clear that, like, this isn't just how people in pop culture are disseminating this to the public. This is in the paleogenomic literature. If you look at, so I didn't focus on this. This is eventually where I want to take whatever this is going to be article, um, is looking at the human genomes. And I have a bit that I've written about the Malta genome, which is a 24,000-year-old uh, Siberian genome. It's Siberian, um, but it has... It has both European and Native American before the, before anyone was even on that continent. Native American ancestry, right? So, and then they the scientists I can't remember this correctly. The scientists go through the paper and they're asked, well, how did that? How did this biological variation come to be? Well, it must be that Europeans moved to Asia, right, and intermated with people there, right? White white colonizers and the agencies of who can move and who can't and who's static and who's transforming are always underlined. So that's just one other example of like, this is, it's always there. The, the connections aren't made explicit, but you see these sort of static race concepts and sort of the agencies of whiteness and colonization playing out, even though they're not made explicit. That's one example, I think that helps. Sorry, yeah. Um, so I think you mentioned that the Siberian genome is the oldest
look at uh, basically the Native Americans, they didn't stop the Europeans. Yeah, German terms, yes. They didn't stop the Europeans and they imported the European cultures and now they're living in reservations. We don't want the same thing to happen to us with our business and just coming in and taking over Europe. So in that sense, there's this These are being utilized for these very How can we like fight back against these things? Uh, my other question was also like in terms of so as you mentioned, uh, these studies, like it's mostly a few research groups which are engaged with that, you mentioned they uh, started with Apple, they started with Apple, they started with Apple, they started So in that sense, uh, I, I feel like this is a, uh, basically a, a, a sense of like colonialism also in some way. <laughs> yeah, it's a good As point. To, like, basically in terms of how research grants are given and who has the money to do these kind of research. In that sense, also, there was this study which came out this year was on nature communications about uh, basically this, um, uh, this uh, group in the 9th century, like Chapo Canyon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look yeah. At the line and where basically, they also got the samples, these data samples from the American Museum of Natural History, which were actually like given a lot of information from any native tribes and a lot of the concentration of that Right. Which, uh, so how does that relate to like also it's also a practice where we are uh, basically reproducing Yeah, so yeah, who has the power to do the scientific research, right? Control the narrative of what gets produced, right? If you I mean, yeah. My answer to that is yes, that, that's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a quick follow up that question. Yeah. Um Spontic I believe educated in Sweden, spent most of his life in Europe versus people like John Ox. Mm -hmm. um, do you see differences in terms of how European labs mm -hmm. versus North American labs mm -hmm. interpret the evidence? Or are there differences in presentation? Um, also, I know there's some genomic research coming out of China. Are there sort of national based differences? You know, That's interesting. Is that something that you've lived into? No, no, it's not something I've thought about. I mean, I have tended to think more along the lines of like what ties these various claims together, but that's an interesting point to think about like how, I guess, people's location, right, and where they're doing this work is shaping the work that they produce. I haven't thought about that. I've more thought along the lines of like how the sort of obsession, especially the German and Dutch obsession with indigenous people, right? S.K. Willer's love is producing really similar narratives to John Hobbes, right? And it's because he's like, obsessed with being native himself in some ways, right? Of like taking on this sort of cultural appropriation of these groups and reproducing them for them. I mean, there are those ties of like cultural appropriation that gets done through genomics and then how that translates into how people are producing the work that I see resonating, but in terms of like how it's distinct, I haven't thought as much of it, but I should. Yeah. Um, are there examples um, of like like a paper you can tell me to go to where Someone did think about the political connotations of the ancient genetic work that they did, or like. So I, I don't. I mean, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by in terms of the political. Um, if you could say a little bit more, but there's there's one paper that looked at. And this is a really early one. It's either in the late nineties or early two thousand that looked at whether microcep the microcephaline gene was introduced from Neanderthals to humans or not. And microcephalins, of course, is kind of capacity, and so that's immediately linked with intelligence. And then white supremacists are again taking up this mantle and going, well, of course, this is why Europeans have bigger brains, and blah, 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 blah. Right? So there's one, there's one example of a paper that has like immediate like um, sort of racial logics in it that have political. But so I'm not sure if that's exactly where you're going. If you want to say more about what you mean by political. I, I meant like who are are doing what um, Basically, not doing the bad part of it. I, I, Who's doing both? Yeah, doing both. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I mean, there. I know there are people. I mean, I know there are people who want to do thoughtful work. Mm -hmm. But and I mean, like it, it gets away from them. Or that they, you know, who has access to this and who has power over who analyzes the samples and who gets the data and who gets to publish it. And, you know, so I know there are people who might interpret this data differently. I mean, put this, put this study in the hands of. A European immigrant from somewhere else, and maybe the story will be right? the sort of situated way that scientists gets produced. 
I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. I hope so. <laughs> yes? So Fox we do vocalization, I'm thinking of Lang and the ability to speak. So I'm thinking yeah. of a speed axe here, and it's a whole time speak. It's yeah. such an interesting word of theme, also going to be quickly about it. Can the Neanderthal speak through the record and you see yourself as some kind of caretaker in that respect? <laughs> 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 Regarding about populations that in the contemporary world there are members of certain colonized populations that can represent themselves to right. varying degrees. But if you're speaking about a population that's long since gone, and yet you know you also hear from speaking about it and so forth, I'm interested in understanding how you see yourself as perhaps caretaking in a voice that is from your Yeah, no, that's beautiful. I haven't, I haven't I don't think I've thought about it explicitly in those terms. I don't see myself as trying to speak for the dead. I try very explicitly not to do that. So rather I'm going, how do other people speak for the dead? And what are the other stories in which we can speak for the dead? Right? What are sort of other possibilities? And I'm not necessarily like, I don't know if I'll, I don't know, I don't know if I'll take this paper in the direction where I attempt to do that. But rather to say like, this, this brings certain possibilities into being and includes other possibilities. What those other possibilities are, I can't quite say. But no, I don't think I'm trying to speak on their behalf. Working in archaeological you know, in other places. I mean, bodies have a form of agency, right? The um, sort of static line that we make between the living and the non-living. Like there is, a, there is an agency in non-living things. But articulating that, I would be, I don't know. If you have a thought, I'd love to hear it. This was fascinating. The whole discourse about whether um, the animals could speak. Yeah, yeah, right. The vocalization and the yeah. reality of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And I, I, I didn't say as much about this, but the FOXP2 gene, so it's, it's a derived variant that's in humans, but there's actually no, so the FOXP2 gene is also found like in mammals. You know what I'm saying? So it's like really, really broad. And like the functional, the functional significance of how FOXP2 influences vocalization is not well understood. Like we know if there's mutations in them, like in like lab mice, for example, suddenly they lose the ability to vocalize in particular ways. But vocalization and language are very different things. I think what's interesting is that we're willing to, given this remodeling, remodeling this refiguring of Neanderthal bodies, we're suddenly willing to say that, that is meaningful evidence for communication. That is meaningful evidence that they were like, <coughs> like us. Because they were outcompeted by mammals. They were just 
<laughs> and then the whole asteroid thing came in, right? And now we know that actually birds are dinosaurs, right? Dinosaurs are not really extinct. They're still here. They're birds, right? So, I mean, it's almost exactly a parallel kind of story to what you're talking about. But there's, and there are certainly ways in which you could think about the kind of colonial science of dinosaur extinction in the 19th century, that was and things like that. But it's not quite as firmly linked to the story as you uh, suggest for the humans, and yet it's so structurally similar. No, I think you're right. I think like the reason you're right. There's slippage, and this is something I'm still working through. So you're so right to point out that like there is this slippage that I'm working through. I think it's because I've moved this paper from writing from a critical race and sort of a queer ecology lens into like a post-colonial space. And so like the language there reflects that slippage of me trying to bring sort of reconcile different models of theory. But you're right. I think like what distinguishes like dinosaurs and people would say dinosaurs are still extinct. Right? Of course. That they've evolved into birds, but Absolutely. dinosaurs are extinct, right? Yeah. Another Especially form. As it happens, really. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Not avian right. dinosaurs. Right, and then the narrative structure, you're right, is very similar. And I would argue, I, I mean, I would predict, I don't know, that very similar stories about land get, and like, sort of endemic species get framed, I would bet, I'm right that in, in very similar ways. Like, so there's a, for example, there's this, I can't, I'm going to stretch here, but there's a study of penguin, Ad Ad Adelie penguins in Australia or New Guinea or somewhere. That where the species arrived about the same time the Europeans did in Australia. And like the, the way that people talk about the extinction of those animals and the replacement and the population turnover of penguins, like exactly mirrors what's happening with Europeans and Aboriginal peoples and that. So I think people are transposing. But I think the argument that I would make is that like that isn't necessarily a settler colonial story until it becomes about domination and land possession. That is what transposes that evolutionary story and that transformation into something that is implicitly explicitly colonial, mm -hmm. right? Because it's about dispossession and claiming of land and bodies and power. There's power. But I'm still... Right. A settler colonial. Settler Not just a generic right. colonial. Right. right, and that's that's a slippage too. And in, in, in Solar's work, and I'm still working on her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. We should talk more about that. But yeah, I think that's a slippage in her work, is that there isn't this indigenous lens, right? So the word imperial... I think in her work isn't quite the same thing as like Tim Tolbert and other Indigenous theorists are talking about talking about genomics. Yeah. But, good point. Yeah. Just a short comment about this question. Like, uh, you must have seen this a few years ago. We did a thousand genomes projects and we were studying good readings. Uh, there was a new support in nature about basically that they're looking at the genetic impact of the time now. Extinct, but we see through the genes that they still live on in modern day regions. So that also is a that kind of big controversy. Yes. There are many different groups which claim final ancestry and say that they're not extinct, but uh, they're still there. Uh, yeah. as a group. So I feel like this is a Yeah, yeah, and I, I would point to Kim Tolbert's work there because, like, there is. So the Taino thing is interesting because, I mean, Europeans are real busy saying that indigenous people are extinct, and they're like, like they're still here, right? And like the, the, the fact that they're extinct and they've been absorbed into the white body really is a work that brings their death under an imperial subjugation. That's Kim Tolbert's whole argument, right? It plays out very differently in Puerto Rico, but you can see some of the difference. Well, thank you very much.